Thank you. And welcome back after coffee. Um, this, this session, uh, we're, we're broken into two sessions now, and this one is to, is to look at, uh, of the Construction Management Day, is to look at BIM, Lean, and Green. Uh, we have five speakers, uh, five excellent speakers, from ranging from RTOC, CISC, uh, TC Estimating, BAM, and the Department of Engineering here in GMIT. So we're a few minutes uh, behind where we wanted to be. We're going to be breaking for lunch at 1 o'clock. And uh, what we might do, if it's okay, we might leave the Q&A until after the five speakers, if that's, if that's okay. So our first speaker up th this morning is no stranger to any of uh, us here working in the BIM world, uh, Ralph Montague. Uh, we're very lucky to have him from Dublin. Ralph is going to uh, give us a talk on using BIM uh, for lean construction. Uh, Ralph is managing partner with Art Docs, uh, a specialist uh, BIM consultancy uh, practice based in Dublin. He's a registered architect with over 20 years experience. Uh, he endorses BIM as a more cost effective and highly efficient way of producing and managing design and construction documentation. We heard a lot of talk about that from all speakers uh, this morning in terms of achieving value for money uh, um, and the type of projects uh, that will be happening uh, and also tied into um, to energy. Ralph is a member of a number of committees. Um, I'm on a number of committees with Ralph. He's, he's a member of the National BIM Council of Ireland. He's chair of the Royal Institute of Architects of Ireland, uh, the practice subcommittee for BIM, and he's also coordinator uh, for the Construction IT Alliance. And just today, I see the CIT here. I'm just delighted to welcome Dr. Barry McCauley here uh, from DIT also in Dublin. Uh, Barry is, is looking after the, the, the BIM Innovation Capability Program uh, for CETA and, and DIT. He's also working uh, with Ralph in, in, and, and Dr. Alan Hoare in that regard. So just thanks for making your way down. Uh, Ralph, I suppose it's fair to say, has been instrumental in the BIM journey uh, since 2009, if not before. So without further ado, uh, Ralph is, is going to take us through his uh, presentation. Great. Thank you, Mark, and uh, thank you everyone for this opportunity to talk to you today about uh, BIM and Lean. Uh, Mark's already introduced me, so I'll skip through that. Um, I suppose this is going to be a talk more about BIM and how it supports Lean rather than Lean itself, but uh, um, I want to make a key takeaway point for everyone today is everybody thinks BIM is about nice 3D models and software, in it, but it's, it's about information about buildings. And information is really important, and it doesn't matter you know, what your role is in the industry, you need information to do your job and in doing your job, you're producing information that other people are going to need to do their job. So, you know, that's a key point. Information is really important. Um, it's, it has value. It is an, a, an asset. You can't um, manage a building without information. You can't effectively deliver the building without information. You can't maintain and operate it. You can't even transact in buildings without the information. So it is a valuable asset and should be looked after the second key point I want to make is that the quality of information profoundly affects all of those things I've just spoken about. So if you have good quality information, things tend to go well, and if you have poor quality information, things tend to go not so well. You know, so, um, and then what do you mean by quality of information? Well, what I mean about quality information is information that is digital, that can be used and reused for many purposes. Uh, it's information that's searchable, it's accessible. It's accurate, um, it's timely that you have the information you need at the right time and it, it, you, you get the information in a format that's useful to you, that you can use it. So I don't think anyone in this room would disagree with what I've just said there, right? Everyone agrees with that. The problem is the way we understand building information in the construction industry is the exact opposite of what I've just said. You know, it's predominantly paper-based, it's... Uh, you know, it's unlikely that it's accurate and because of the way it's produced and when it's produced. It's, it's in a very static format. It's very difficult to search or query. Uh, and in that format, it's very difficult to keep up to date. So that's the kind of problem we're having to deal with when we talk about information in the construction industry. Um, 
things don't have to be that way. And when you look at other industries and in other areas of life, we've just come to appreciate better ways of working with information. So when you want to book your, your next holiday, you know, you're not sitting in the travel agents paging through a printed copy of the flight schedule of every airline that goes to your destination. You're going online, you're entering your destination, immediately you're presented with you know, multiple options from multiple airlines, price options from different travel agencies. You make a selection, you enter your card details, and that's it, your, your holiday is booked. You know, we, that's just the way we expect to work with information in other areas of life. But in the construction industry, if you want to know something about a building, you've got to go spend half a day in a storeroom full of lever arch files looking for stuff, and then when you finally find it, you, you don't trust it anyway, because you, you, you're guessing it's probably out of date. So this boom to me is about the digitization of the construction industry. When we talk about an information model, I'm not talking about just a 3D, you know, nice 3D model. We're talking about all the information that represents the, the, the built asset. So we're talking about documents, we're talking about graphical data, we're talking about non-graphical data. And just to look at what happens to that information over the life cycle of a building, we spend enormous amounts of time and money during design and construction producing lots of information. Uh, some of it in design stage, more of it in construction stage. A yeah. uh, lot, lot, lot of effort put in, put in, and we hand it all that over to a client in a boxes of lever arch files or on a CD or something, and this is what happens. Over the life cycle of the building, the information enters this cycle of continuously degrading and depleting because it's in a static format that can't be kept up to date. There's no plan to keep it up to date. Uh, and so very quickly it loses its value. And um, obviously that's not ideal for a building owner or an asset, anybody who owns an asset. So at some point in time you have to implement a strategy that avoids that happening, you know, that's going to turn that around and say, you know, we have to maintain our information about our built assets uh, in, in a, you know, a digital way. You know, so you have to have a digital strategy. and. These, all these plans are coming from best practice in asset management, ISO 55000 and various other standards we can talk about. Now, obviously, the sooner you can implement that strategy, the less it's going to cost you. you know, in fact, if you implemented the strategy right at the beginning of a project, it would cost you nothing because people have to produce the information anyway. All you're asking them to do is produce it in a way that you know, fits into your digital strategy. The value that that information is going to bring to your project is going to be highest the earlier you, you can move that line into the project. So I suppose the, the key point there is, you know, start soon with your, your digital strategy. Don't wait until you uh, receive the building or, uh, or even oh, in, into its life cycle. A lot of the discussion I find around BIM is in the design community. You know, ar architects and engineers <coughs> talk about BIM as a way to produce better information. A lot of the discussion about lean is around construction, you know, and how we produce, how we deliver buildings. But it seems to me that nobody is really looking at this from the whole life cycle point of view. And so we've, we've got to get, uh, you know, building owners and you know, building operators involved in this this discussion. <clears throat> the problem starts with the way we produce information in this industry. You know, we, it's predominantly paper-based, as I said, so we produce lots of drawings and specifications and you know, these are all separate documents that have to be manually produced, manually updated, manually coordinated. Every time you make a change, you've got to go through all those documents again, make sure that change is reflected. So it's a very time-consuming, lab-intensive <laughs> process. It's prone to human error. But even w with the, those problems of producing it, the way that information gets used by others is problematic because, as I said earlier, you can't search the data. You can't. Uh, it's very difficult to do analysis on all the data. You know, it's, it's all very manual. There's a lot of it creates a lot of confusion. You know, there's a lot of people involved in the industry that don't actually understand drawings. And you know, if you're not an architect or an engineer, it's, it's not a very good communication tool for your clients, etc. So, yeah, there's all these things are happening: uh, misunderstanding, cost, costly administration, delays, variations. And we're living with all these things on projects every day. You know, all of those things, by definition, are waste. You know, they don't add any value to the, the building itself. So organizations that measure these kinds of things would say that th over 30% of the cost of construction is waste. You know, that's an enormous percentage, uh, and it's something we need to do. We need to do something about that. 
So I suppose BIM is a, a different approach uh, to producing information. It, the, the idea is you build a virtual building in software from objects that represent their real life counterpart. So you, you literally assemble the building in software. Every object is a container or a placeholder of the information about that component of the building. So you only enter that information once into one place, into the object. Uh, now the immediate benefit of using a BIM process is that you have this virtual building. You can look around it, you can walk around it, you can take your clients through it. You, know, you can check that things are going to work before you actually go and spend real time and money on site. Um, now you can still get the traditional outputs from a BIM process. So if you need a set of drawings, or you need a schedule or details, etc., you get those, but the, 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 the idea is that those are generated as a view of the model. Yeah, so that's not a drawing that somebody's had to manually draft. It's a view of the model that's used for the purpose of an output. But the key thing to think about BIM is that the effort goes into creating the model and maintaining the model. So if you need to make a change in the design of the building, you can make the change once in the model, and every drawing and every schedule and every output is automatically updated. So it's a far more efficient way of working. And um, the next key point is that it's n this is not, BIM is not something you add to a traditional way of working. It's an alternative methodology. So the traditional way is your intellectual and produ productivity, uh, pro uh, productive input goes into the production of lots of documents. In BIM, that effort goes into the construction of the virtual building. You can extract documents from it, but you know, you, you're putting your time and effort in a completely different place. One is a far more efficient way of working. Now, the reason I'm mentioning this is because what we're seeing in practice in industry is what I call pseudo BIM. You know, that's where the, the design team continue to work in a traditional two-dimensional way. They're designing in 2D drawings and documents. And then in the corner of the office somewhere, they, you know, there's a guy who's frantically trying to convert everything back into a model because you know, the client maybe asked for a model. Um, obviously, if you do BIM that way, You've just taken a slow, expensive, problematic process and you've added something on top of it. You've made it yeah, more expensive. You, know, you need to do, do BIM completely the opposite way. Use the methodology of constructing the virtual building once and using that as a way to generate outputs. Sorry. When we talk about BIM level two, there's different levels of maturity, but effectively what it means is at level two, each discipline is working in, in a separate model. Now you'd think we're, we're building one building, why don't, why don't we just all work in one model? Obviously, you know, that makes sense, but because of the, the way our contracts are written, because of the insurances we have, you have to keep a, a clear line of responsibility between the different disciplines. So everybody builds their element of the building in a separate model, but you can bring that together in software in what's called the federated model. And it's in that federated model environment that you can coordinate the design and check that everything's going to fit and work before you get, get, onto, get onto the site. Also, since you have um, this virtual model, you can do things which you couldn't do before. For instance, you can link every object in the model to your construction program and play through a simulation of how you're going to actually construct this building in the virtual environment and look at issues of logistics, health and safety, etc., before you're on site and dealing with real problems. You can link every object in the model to a cost database and let computers do what computers do really well, which is count stuff quickly and accurately. So for better cost control, it means you need people who can work with this kind of data. Um, you can analyze this virtual building. You can put, you put the building in real you know, <coughs> space with real weather data, etc. You can do structural analysis. You can do energy analysis. You can do all sorts of analysis. I've seen programs that will do pedestrian movement analysis. So if you, you, know, you can virtually work out how this building is going to function and work and perform before you actually build it and uh, to optimize the design. And the last part of BIM is that um, you can collect within those objects all the information that a future operator is going to need to operate the building. That could be the installation date, the, wa the warranty period, etc. So yeah, it be, the, the model itself becomes a very rich database of searchable, accurate information that people can actually use rather than a whole set of documents. So these different aspects of them, the 3D, 4D, 5D, there are different dimensions. You'll, you'll see why these become important when you think about what it is clients want. 
Yeah, because I can tell you this, clients don't want BIM. You know, clients want better project outcomes. And by that I mean they want better buildings, built quicker and built cheaper. And everybody's thinking, well, you can't have that. You can't have all three. You know, if you want something better, you've got to spend more time, you've got to spend more money. You know, but if you can think about, if you can cut out some of the waste and improve the way we work and, and uh, have more efficient processes, more lean processes, then maybe we can turn some of the waste, that 30% waste, back into value and quality. But th these are the things that are important to clients. You know? And if you look at the UK construction strategy targets, they want to produce 50% better buildings. And the way they're going to measure that is through carbon performance. In other words, better performing, performing uh, buildings. 50% quicker and 33% cheaper. So you, know, you might think, well, those are ridiculous or ambitious targets. I can tell you this, if the industry in the UK and other markets are striving to that, towards that, and we're not, we're going to very quickly become uncompetitive in the way we work. From a client's point of view, they want to understand what it is they're getting. You know, what's the scope of the building? They want to understand when they're going to get it. You know, how long is it going to take to build? What's it going to cost? They're interested in the quality. How, you know, <coughs> is it going to be durable? How long is it going to last? What will it cost to maintain and operate? They, they're really interested in value for money. And more importantly, they're interested in certainty. For a lot of clients, constructing is not their core business. You know, and they're relying on the professional teams that they, they employ to help them deliver the, you know, the, the building with certainty. And to be honest, for most clients, the, the process of going through construction is probably the worst thing they'll do in their lifetime you know, because of all the problems and the delays and the variations and every project just about ending up in court. You know, it's not a fantastic experience. I know we, in the construction industry we've learned to live with that and it's, it's, it's almost challenging and fun, but you know, it's not the way to go. <coughs> what has this got to do with BIM? Well, the, the 3D aspects of BIM help the clients understand the scope, help everybody, everybody else understand the scope. The, the fact that you have a virtual building that everybody can you know, look at, look around, dissect, etc., uh, helps the understanding the scope. The 4D aspects of BIM helps everybody understand the program, the time, you know, how this is going to be delivered. The 5D aspects of BIM helps everybody understand the costs. The 6D aspects of BIM, all the analysis, is about producing better quality buildings. You analyze and you optimize to, to build the best solution rather than the first solution. And the 7D aspects of them are also a quality issue in my opinion in that you're delivering digital, searchable, accurate data that people can use at the end of the project. So you, know, the, you can see that BIM touches on all the things that are important to clients. Um, and I'd say you know, as a project team, if you're only doing 3D BIM, okay, that's fine, it's nice, you've got a 3D model and you, you're helping people understand the scope and coordinate the design. But if you're not doing these other aspects of BIM, 4D, 5D, 6D, then you're not really dealing with all the issues that are important to clients. So, as I said, information is really important to everyone. It doesn't matter what you do. You, know, you need information to do your job. You're producing information. Other people need your information to do their job. So, you know, if we're going to do this in a lean and efficient <coughs> way, um, you know, we, I, don't, I don't see how you can do it in a paper-based uh, environment. So if we look at the lean principles and apply it to how we deal with information, you know, how do we move information from one place to another? You know, uh, somebody was just telling me that the cost of printing all the drawings for the planning application for the children's hospital was something like 80,000 euros. You know, just lots of paper, what's the point? Like the, the council's gonna receive all this paper and then scan it. You know. <laughs> you know, why didn't we just issue a digital file from the, from the, the first thing? How we store information, you know, storing information in rooms full of lever arch files that are just almost useless and in, in, impenetrable. You, it's difficult to find information. Um, motion, how we work as a, as a team. You know, we have to print the drawings out, get around a table and look at the drawings, whereas in these virtual environments, you could have people from all around the world coming into the virtual environment and, and, and collaborating. You know, the weight, you know, updating information and waiting for information in a traditional 2D <coughs> process you know, is, is very slow, you know, and that's, that causes a lot of delays in, in the way we work. So you know, using a digital process would obviously help that. The over-processing, 
every time you use fancy technology to produce information and then print it out on a piece of paper to hand off to the next person, the next person has to re-input the information into their fancy technology. And, you, know, you can just see there's nothing efficient or lean about the way we use information as we go through the cycles. Um, overproduction. We, we tend to produce too much information, uh, which becomes abortive information at the end as decisions are being made. And defects. You know, because of the slow way in which information is produced and the, the fact that you can't keep everything coordinated and up to date means you end up with a lot of defects within the information and resulting in def uh, physical defects on uh, sites. And then skills. You know, I think the, the, the people we're educating in these courses and in these universities have got better things to do than coordinate manual documents, you know, and sit and cross-check and recheck and, you know, you should be impl apl applying your, te your skills to, to better things. So my question, if we're going to talk about lean and, and information, is can lean really work without them? Can we be efficient? Better information, in my opinion, supports the way the industry collaborates. It supports all the principles of, of uh, collaboration, such as early engagement, assessment of price, you know, because you've got digital data that you can analyze, use immediately, uh, aligning of business objectives, etc. I have a bit of time pressure, so I'll skip through these. But, you know, doing all of that with paper documents is impossible or slow. So it all sounds good, right? What's the catch? There is a catch. Everything I've said up to this point is not going to happen. You know, it's not going to happen unless there's a clearly defined managed process put in place that requires everyone who's participating on the project to work in this way I've just described. So we need a standard way of working. And uh, the fortunate thing for us in Ireland is we don't have to develop these standards. So when the UK government set out their strategy uh, five years, six years ago, you know, they've committed to developing all the standards that are, and guidance and, ev and everything you need to, to use this process. We just got to pick it up and use it. So in the words of that great 20th century philosopher, Nike, you know, we just need to do it. Okay. Very briefly, you know, the PAS 1192 is probably the most applicable standard for the, the delivery phase of projects. And it's a very simple document that sets out that a few key things have to, have to happen. The, the employer has to document exactly what the information requirements are. They need to check the capability of people they're employing on projects that, to work this way. You have to put a few commercial things in place, like a, you've got to make BIM contractual so people are legally obliged to, to participate this way. You've got to appoint a, an information manager to, to oversee the whole process, you know, some issues and guidance. You've got to put together a digital plan of work. When you're tendering on projects, whether you're tendering for design or construction, you need to prepare a pre-contract BIM execution plan to s set out how you're going to deliver to those employers' information requirements. Once you get appointed to the team, you sit together as a team and you prepare what's called the post-contract BIM execution plan, which is a document which sets out how the team is actually going to deliver to the employers' information requirements. You've got to set up a common data environment, a central repository of all the information that's carefully managed, and ultimately you've got to, you've got to set out the, the deliverables, the digital deliverables of a project. That's all the document says. You know, it's not that complicated. Um, it's not rocket science, I suppose, is what I'd like to say. Like A lot of people are making a big fuss about it, and there's, I know there's a lot of terminology and, in the documents, but effectively what it's setting out is doing what you should have been doing anyway. You should be setting out uh, the requirements and responsibilities of a project. You should be setting out how you're going to deliver it before you actually do it. You've got to make it contractual. You, you've got to put someone in charge. You've got to check that everyone um, has the capability. You've got to keep all the information in a central place and make sure that the data is well structured. That's all it is. Um, and number one rule, avoid pseudo boom if at all possible. So, you know, there's lots of acronyms to learn, but I mean, you get to get through them very quickly. Um, there's lots of tools available. The RAI have put some two documents together to help industry, a, a template EIR and BEP. In the UK, they've, they've developed a free toolkit for people to do their digital plan of works. Um, there's some documents that the Construction Industry Council have put together in terms of the scope of service for information management, etc., uh, and some other template <coughs> documents. So 
all, all, everything we need is there, we've just got to use it. When you look at the things you need to know and do to be BIM level 2 compliant, what you realize very quickly is this has got nothing to do with software. Well, not, not nothing, but you know, only the last two things involve software. It's a project management issue. You know, it's about how we run projects effectively. And uh, the second last thing, for most people, it's enough to have the ability to open and look at the model, interrogate the model with a free viewer. You know, there's, there's only a small amount of people that are actually going to produce the information at the end of the day. So it's, you know, it's not a, something that everybody has to spend like weeks learning how to use BIM software. So in summary, you know, the key point is that this is a process. It's, it involves software, but it's not about software. It's not about buying software. It's about streamlining the way we work, so being more lean about the way we produce and share information, coming up with better quality information. It's all about the information at the end of the day and how that's used in the life cycle. Just two slides to quickly make you aware. In Europe, you know, there's a lot happening. They've changed the procurement directives to allow for BIM. There's a European uh, uh, task group which is looking at that, that whole issue of um, BIM for public procurement. There's a European standards group that's developing standards in conjunction with international standards groups. Um, I suppose, to me, these things are either an opportunity or, th or a threat. You know, the opportunity, if we become good at this in Ireland, is that we, would, we can win work all over the world because you know, it's, be it's becoming a standard way of working. The threat is if we don't become good at it, people will be coming and taking the work here because they'll be, be able to deliver quicker, cheaper, better buildings. And the go-to place, I suppose, if you want to get to know anything about BIM in Ireland, is the Construction IT Alliance. It's a multidisciplinary group of people who are interested in how technologies are used in construction. Um, you know, it's well supported by industry stakeholders. There's about 7,000 people on the LinkedIn group having discussions about this. There's nine regional groups, including uh, Galway. Um, there's going to be a BIM gathering conference at the end of this year. Uh, CETA is the Secretariat of the National BIM Council, and also um, we are now engaging with the National Standards Authority of Ireland. So that's what we do. If anybody needs help and support, that's what our company offers. Thank you. Thanks, Val, for that <coughs> rapid fire. Okay, while well, you're setting up, our next speaker is <coughs> Killian Kelly. Uh, Ke Killian is is uh, is going to talk about 4D construction sequencing. Uh, Killian is BIM leader uh, for John Sisk and Sons contractors uh, in Ireland. He's a former student uh, of GMIT. He completed the BSc in Architectural uh, Technology uh, back in the day. He's also a certified uh, Autodesk professional. He's a BIM accredited uh, professional from the BRE Global in the UK. He's completed a postgrad in BIM management and he's also co chair of the Eastern uh, BIM regions. Uh, Killian Kelly. Thank you, folks. He's all there. Um, so, yeah, so former student GMIT uh, would have been uh, in here with Jim O'Connor, uh, Mary Rogers, and then it was in same class as uh, Jared Nicholson so uh, probably since then I've been with CISC started off as a site engineer and probably worked my way up when I would have been with CISC um, when I started with Enforced there was no BIM strategy within the company so since then I'm probably on a six year period where I'm trying to introduce new techniques uh, lean process get the site engineer set now using a 3D model engaging with design teams architects clients and um, so really it's been a probably a process over the last couple of years and just developing since then um, would have been architecture technology that I was studying, but I would have come from a uh, construction background, so the family business, we would be main contractors, so I was always trying to get back in the, uh, to main, uh, main contractors and the construction industry. Um, so today I'm going to talk about um, 4D construction sequencing. Um, just as you go. Um, so 4D BIM. I'll just give a quick overview of uh, CISC. So really, um, established in 1859, one of the largest construction groups in Ireland, the UK, fifth generation family business, uh, market leading contractors uh, for over 50 years, reputation of leading large projects, and uh, 
I work with industry leading clients, strong culture of safety, and delivering quality over 30 years in the construction market and annual uh, turnover of over 1 billion. So probably on that, um, and I could even have to say myself, it is a family run business. Like the, the, the likes of Owen System Directors to be in the office and if you had something that you'd like to put forward or you had an idea, it's that type of a business where you can actually uh, probably develop your ideas and th they're very helpful in terms of any training or any uh, innovation that you might be bringing towards the company. In terms of experience with BIM, so <coughs> the when I, uh, so the UCD Science Centre is probably one of the first projects um, that would have taken uh, as a pilot project for introducing BIM within CISC. Um, before then you had the Aviva Stadium, so I suppose on that you had the facade structure that would have been done uh, using Tecla, um, where they actually were, were they had, um, the facade would have been done uh, using uh, Tecla for the model and that's what they were actually producing the facade in. But for an actual full BIM project, the UCD Science Centre would have been the first project in which CISC um, took it upon themselves to really develop the architects or design teams design and develop um, a 3D model from that. Um, so then since then you have your Microsoft uh, data centers, so we would have been there um, over the last 10 years working with Microsoft and again that's an international client where they weren't engaged with BIM and it was something that we were bringing to the table and since then we've developed um, the requirements. So uh, we're in the next phase uh, on that project and we have full, um, it's a BIM hub out on site that we have uh, essentially an office where we have the design team, subcontractors, main contractors based in the one location uh, and we have the model and they're coordinating the model um, right throughout the, pod, or throughout the project and the engineers are coming in, they're getting their information, they're setting it, so it's a lean construction process. We're introducing that uh, on this project but now Microsoft is um, I suppose speaking to us and we're uh, looking to introduce that process globally going forward. Um, so then the CERC, which was the Limerick University Hospital, so we've just handed over that project in December. It's the first BIM Level 2 uh, public works contract where it would have been uh, continued right from design, during construction, and now we've um, developed it in a way that we've handed over into operations. So we've met with the HSC and their operations team in terms of how they're going to um, update the the model throughout uh, operations and as Ralph was saying it's about managing the information and how is the information going to develop right throughout the, the uh, life cycle of the building. Uh, Aragon Biologics 2 uh, would have been one of the first projects that I was involved in so I'd be lead on that job uh, and there was a number of different contractors on the job that would have took along the journey with us, um, Kirby's, Ardmac, uh, Morns, um, I suppose it would have been one of the first projects for a lot of us in the industry to be introduced to BIM and uh, since then, um, I, most of the companies uh, coming out of that project are now all operating in BIM on every project going forward. Um, okay, so look, I'll dive into the, uh, the 4D side of it. So really just a quick overview, as Ralph was kind of explaining the different dimensions within BIM. So you have your 3D, which is a 3D model. So it's design, review, clash, section, coordination, concept, design. Um, detailed design and design for manufacturing assembly, uh, which would be doing a lot in terms of the retrofit and farmer jobs. We'd be doing a lot of prefab information or prefabbing a lot of the um, services before we actually come to site. Uh, so then 40 is a topic that I'm going to discuss today. So it's the planning, logistics, construction sequencing, health and safety, uh, program management, 5D, um, which is your bill of quantities, uh, cost management, 6D, sustainability analysis, and 7D, uh, your facilities management. So as I was saying, I'm going to discuss the topic of 4D, but we've essentially, we're currently operating on different projects. Um, some projects were just operating in 3D, some projects was just 3D and 4D, and some projects um, were operating right up to 7D. So it depends on um, what client you're working with, if it's a public sector, private client, um, and really what's the, the requirements, because um, if it's not a requirement to carry out facilities management in terms of linking it to a 3D model, there's a lot of added work uh, on the main contract or on the supply chain and if it's something that the client's not asking for a handover or well then it might necessarily be um, the route would be taken but essentially uh, like, uh, the ideal project would be if the client is asking for all of these things and it's a BIM level 2 project and they have their standards set up and the design team followed it and we can just roll that out on the project but it's not always the reality when you come to a project in the industry today. So an introduction to 4D, so essentially a well-structured billing information model is, is extremely useful resource for all the project team members. By linking scheduled data to different components, uh, you can generate accurate progr 
program information to enable a step-by-step -step visual uh, of your project's development. This process is known as 4D BIM. 4D BIM is a process of linking time to a construction project, project in a 3D environment. Uh, this project involves linking a 3D model and construction program with a direct link to each activity of the Gantt chart. So the Gantt chart, uh, so probably if the construction management would be your construction program which you can develop in either Asta Power Project, Primavera or MicroStation. So you'd link this visibly to your 3D model. Uh, these animated models represent plan construction sequence set against time. Um, so even as Ralph was saying, this probably in terms of BIM level 2, 4D isn't actual a BIM require or, or a requirement on uh, BIM level two, although it is um, a benefit to the project. It's not you're not contracted in to produce a 4D model or 5D on the project, but it definitely is, brings benefit. And as a main contractor, we'd be trying to introduce 4D on every project we'll be uh, developing BIM on. Um, so 4D, really, just some of the uh, things that um, will be included. So uh, so 4D involves time related activities linked to your BIM model. This includes the following, so your des design phase, your production of information. In terms of um, if it's a design and build for traditional build, actual production of information, if you can link that uh, physically to your model, um, you can see how your model is going to develop at an early stage. The start date on site, bulk dig, excavation period, temporary works, demolition, construction, installation period, fit out period, commission and handover. Uh, and construction phases. If your project is going to be built in different phases, you can quite easily show that on a 4D model, which we've had to do in a lot of cases where it might be a phased construction sequence and the client is going to be occupying the building and we'd have to show how we're going to phase the construction. So um, that would draw us straight to de developing a model, construction program, and developing um, a 4D uh, construction sequence. So it's re the real people that sh um, benefit from this is uh, the contracts managers and planners can easily develop an accurate construction program uh, for the project based on a uh, better, un better understanding of the project and the sequence of work. So the next point is just briefly is um, really around the software that you'd be using. Um, so as I mentioned with the Gantt chart, you could either be using Asta, uh, Primavera, um, to develop your Gantt chart, so your actual construction program. So there's different platforms out there at the minute that you can then take that construction program and your 3D model and then start linking the two together. Um, so as the power project, um, essentially, um, I say 80% of our projects uh, in Ireland would be using as the power project for developing the construction program. So all of our planners, our contract managers, senior engineers, they're using as the power project. Then you have Autodesk and Navis Works, which has a 4D functionality um, in uh, the package. And then Synchro Professional, which is actually dedicated to 4D um, planning software. I suppose um, in, in terms of the software, like that's uh, really if you were planning on forced time trying to develop a, a construction sequence or trying to get yourself involved in it, uh, Navis Works is probably the best tool to get started with. But if you're really taking this, um, that you wanted to develop it going forward and you wanted to update it, um, Sync will probably be the one of choice and it probably seems to be the, the package that um, is probably at the forefront currently at the industry. And now as the Power Project has a BIM uh, solution that you can now import IFC models, which is a file format, into your as the Power Project and you can start linking that to your model. So, um, preference, I'd probably be working with Synchro and uh, we'd develop the models in Synchro and then we'd use that going <coughs> forward just because of the reliability and the outputs we can get. Because in some uh, cases we'd have a tender period where we'd have to turn around these models within a two week period and you'd have to produce that back to your, your clients. So you'd have to have your design review meetings, you'd have to have um, all your review meetings done with your project team and a lot of the sequence of works might have changed. So in a two week period, um, you don't want to be taking risk in terms of. Um, the outputs that you can get with the different packages. So 40, the way if I'm going to go with starting um, a 40 construction sequence, I'd say to any contracts manager or senior planner, um, really three things that I'm going to need on the job to get started. Uh, develop your construction program. So as I was saying, ask the power project. Um, and then with that, you'd have to just make sure what version you're going to be, be working on in terms of how you're going to develop your, pro or your, your, uh, your program and what version it's going to be on. Um, then develop your construction methodology. So that's really how are you going to go about building your building. 
Um, this can be done in PowerPoint, it can be done freehand on sketches. Essentially, this would be the contracts manager, senior engineer, your engineers in the job, telling you how you're gonna go about building the building, how you're gonna start your bulk dig, how you're gonna start um, your foundations, how you're gonna start um, your forced slab pours, how your slab is gonna be poured, how your steel is gonna start being erected, how your facade is gonna go on, um, right through to your finishes. So that's, those decisions have to be made from your contract manager, your senior engineers, and your planners on the site. That can't be left to a BIM engineer or a BIM coordinator making these decisions of how the building's gonna be built. So really with this, it's a full project team effort that you have the right people in the room making the right decisions. The step three then would be physically when you would have the likes of the BIM engineer on the job and he's carrying out the task of physically linking um, the tasks on the program to your um, items in your 3D model and you create sets within your 3D model. So um, and I'll, I'll talk a wee bit about that in a second. So the management of 4D BIM. So as you can see there, it's an open conversation that you'd have on a project. <coughs> And again, as I was saying, ensure the correct professionals uh, are making the project decisions. So you have your contracts manager saying, I want the site compound set up in this corner, the site boundary, I want traffic management coming in. Uh, and then your senior engineer saying, yeah, well, it's best we start the bulk excavation this way so we can start building a road as we're working away. That you're making um, these decisions with your project team and it's not left to um, either a BIM engineer or um, a BIM coordinator on site that, that shouldn't really be taking on these decisions. This, this should be made from the project team. So um, as I said, I'd either go to the contract manager, I said, look, if, it's, if we're under pressure, just get a couple of A3s, sketch out what way you want to go about building the project, hand them over to me, and at least I can understand how he's going to go about building it. Um, then some people might mark it up in PowerPoint, but again, as I said, if you sketch it out, quick process to get the, um, the construction methodology started. Um, the next thing is ensuring the file name and version remains the same uh, for the project duration. So <coughs> I'm not going to go too much into, I suppose, BIM level 2 and file name and that side of things, but this all ties in uh, to your information and how you're managing your projects. And this is key to um, ensuring that the link between your 3D model and your program maintains the same right throughout construction. If at some stage your contract manager starts your program, he hands it on to a planner, the planner changes the, the name on the program, um, then you're going to lose the link between the model and your construction <coughs> program. So it's something that you have to, at the start of the job, this is what the, the program is going to be named, this is how we're going to name the model, and if you have a number of different models, um, that those names remain the same, so that you can have an automatic and you can synchronise your program as it's developing. So if your design team is still developing your model and you might get an update within two weeks, if you have the same file name, uh, then you should be fit to synchronize and you should keep the link between your construction program and your model. The next thing will be agree dates, draft review, deadlines. So really, as I said, <coughs> in some cases we might have a two-week turnaround, but ideally if you had um, you know, a six-week turnaround to, to turn around a, a 40 construction sequence and a detailed construction sequence that you'd outline when I'm going to get my construction program, uh, when I'm going to get my construction methodology, and when I'll have either I have a 3D model to start with and if I don't have a 3D model how long do I need to develop that 3D model so I suppose these would be things that you would sit down and you'd probably you'd map out at the start of the project and making sure that you're tracking that right throughout the job and um, so agree communication and meetings so if it was a six week turnaround that you'd have a review meeting after the first two weeks you'd review see where your model is do you have your site set up uh, compound logistics all of that developed at this stage, is your construction program nearly finished, is your construction methodology, and if you set these meetings that they're productive and that you're coming out of the meeting and you know that right in two days time or three days time I have to have a review of the construction sequence. Uh, so live review meetings. So in a lot of cases um, if it's a project based uh, 4D model that you would be using this uh, and you might have your everyone based in the one room uh, so you can make those decisions, you'd have your contract manager, your planner, your construction, um, or your, your BIM engineer, all based on site, and, and it's, I suppose it's a team effort for developing um, the model throughout the job, but in a lot of cases, your project team might be based on the one site, so you, um, what we've found in the past that, um, like even for myself, I'd be based uh, in Dublin in the head office, but I'd be working on a number of different projects around the country, but I'd be using Skype as a communication tool, so I'd 
uh, log on to the computer, I'd show the synchro model and it'd be fit to explain to the conflict manager, here's where we are on this project at the minute, he can start making decisions, but it's a communication tool that um, really making yourself more productive, efficient, uh, and, and really getting answers uh, to some of the things. Yeah. So <coughs> I just skim through a couple of things in this there. So again, that's basically just showing you have your Gantt chart and you have your 3D model and you're physically linking items um, to your 3D model. So I'll just give you some examples um, of the projects. So with this here, essentially, you can see at the start, and I've sped this up just because of the length of the video. This would have been done in Google um, Earth, and it's quite simple and effective, but the client was actually based in the States, and we had to give them an understanding of the project and where they're going to be based. So we've done this in Google Earth just as an intro to the construction sequence. Then we actually linked this uh, into, this is Synchro that we're currently using. So on this here, you'd be using for your better project understanding and awareness of the whole project team, traffic management, logistics, site setup, site boundaries, better communication to the clients, minimizing risk due to better planning, optimizing construction methodology, and give confidence to clients based on the construction program. So with this, there's a number <coughs> of different ways you can carry out a 40 uh, model. Um, you can have a timeline running across the um, top or the bottom of it, uh, or else you could just have um, bullet points showing at the different uh, phases of the project. So this is Capital Doc, we're currently, uh, so this was key probably to um, making the decision to the client that we could meet the program, uh, when they could move into the building, the fit out, uh, and how we're going to be actually um, affecting the surrounding buildings. Uh, so we did a number of different uh, reviews of this construction sequence, but you can see even how the slab is, is, is split up there, that we would have been a project that the client was, I suppose, this was a requirement during the, the um, tender and period period uh, with the client and it was key to probably making the decision and there's a number of different contracts that were, would be involved and this seems to be a big part of it and um, a number of the big public works contracts it, it's now become a requirement that you either have to provide a 10 minute or three minute long construction sequence of how you're going to go with building the building essentially that's a 40 BIM model um, and now it's becoming contracted into, into the projects so tight for time here but I'll just give you a quick overview there's a couple of examples here so on this here when we're actually starting on site now um, <coughs> it's just after uh, St. Patrick's weekend and this would be how we're going to integrate with a live uh, environment. So this is uh, the Bonds Hospital in Cork and uh, so we're maintaining uh, a live bill and drone operations, interactive with the public and staff. So uh, the client, they had a car park, they wanted to see how they can get access to the back car park um, throughout the construction of the project. Should we so we were fit to really show that we'd maintain a full access road throughout the project for um, really to, make, uh, to give confidence to the client that they have a fully operational building throughout the construction. Uh, so better understand <coughs> care communication, safety awareness, public awareness. So then this, again, can be, will be showing your safety inductions to your site team, telling the lads, look at this, this is where um, the construction sequence is going to be uh, for the next couple of weeks. And um, this give con confidence to the client, again, to, to really uh, show how we're going to go about op or con constructing the building. So then this here would be... Um, uh, Wembley Parade in uh, London and then on the right hand side you can see this is kind of uh, dealing more towards the uh, fit out and actual construction uh, sequence uh, floor by floor so we have a, a table on the right hand side and then on the left we have a legend that we have work complete, work in progress and work incomplete so you can see as we're going up floor by floor we're seeing um, if we have our windows <coughs> complete or scaffolding or brickwork uh, or scaffolding um, strike and then our balconies and so on the on the right hand side you can see how we're demonstrating that to the client and there's a number of different ways but just on this one i suppose this is for residential and high-rise buildings um the next thing that we'll be looking at the a19 in newcastle so this is a project where um it's a the it's a BIM <coughs> level two project and uh I suppose it was mandated that they want, the client wanted to see a construction sequence carried out right throughout the project. That we had this uh, on our progress reports that we show a sequence of work, the construction durations, that we had multi activities in the same location, uh, that all the roads uh, were still live throughout it, and then um, what we had, the construction sequence that we're showing is actually a planned and actual. So we're planned to be in construction where we actually are, if we're head or behind in certain activities. Um, the next is just quickly showing you an overview. So that's actually the construction progress currently on site. So you can see um, this is a key to probably um, 
with the client and the progress report meetings that you can kind of determine where we are on site and how that relates back to your 40 construction sequence. And the next, just quickly on um, live projects. So a former student is currently um, working on this project now at the minute and one of his roles on a weekly basis is updating the 4D construction sequence so that during uh, our safety inductions that you would the uh, site team would be up on 2,000 staff on peak on this project and um, that they would all be seeing how they're going to entrance the site how what's the weekly look ahead and what's the progress report and uh, so one of the activities that the uh, former <coughs> that I've been mentioned there he um, that's working on the job he updates this model on a weekly basis and then this is part of the, as you're coming into the site, this is shown on the screen, it's shown in the canteen. Uh, and on the whiteboard meetings that we'd have, uh, the synchro model, and we can actually navigate around it and show where, we, where the construction sequence is actually happening throughout the project. So again, as I was saying, uh, you can just see that, uh, I suppose, the benefits then, bringing this then, tied into it with uh, uh, drone footage on site. So we actually have drone footage on site that we can overlay beside your, your 4D construction sequence. So quite quickly the client can see, well actually you're ahead or you're behind and uh, it's just another added benefit to, to what we're currently doing out on site. Um, from that, sorry, you can then take snapshots and mark them up for your progress report and live examples. So these will be done weekly, saying where the activities are happening on site. Um, and really the, the, the project team is now dead this is what the, where they're going to, to see how we're, how we're getting on on, on construction program. And as I said, this project in particular, when we've demonstrated this to the client, the client is sold on it, and now he wants us to um, demonstrate this a bit for contractors globally. With that, you have better communication across the whole project team, so you get your project teams involved, and then out on site, we're showing the weekly activities happening on site. So just to close that, just really the key benefits to uh, 4D BIM, so your clear communication in real time, side by side scenarios, uh, troubleshoot and optimize the delivery uh, approach, uh, support and distribution, uh, delivery team uh, and integrated supply chain, existing site uh, constraints, services, utilities, temporary works model, uh, building sequence defined in model, uh, construction sequence in for visual from program and uh, time duration outputs. Uh, fed cost assumptions. So really with that 4D BIM, like as I said, on every project we'd, where we'd have a 3D model, we'd be trying to introduce a 4D BIM on the project and the clients is now becoming a requirement from the clients on a lot of uh, contracts. So um, there's different ways of going about it and probably the, the starting point, as I said, might be Navis Works, but if you're, it's going to be something that you're going to be updating on a weekly basis, then Synchro probably would be the best platform to go forward with. Um, just probably winning. What I am here as well, that we'd be current, like there would be positions within CISC where the contract managers um, are now looking for um, engineers coming through that have these skills that can update the, the uh, 40 um, program on a weekly basis and so it's, a, it's probably it's a skill that uh, it's, it's a requirement and there's a niche in the industry at the minute for people with these skills so that's it thanks very much thanks Gillian our next uh, topic is 5D costing uh, with uh, with BIM uh, Ingus Callahan is, is uh, a director for TC Estimating Services here in Galway. He's a registered uh, quantity surveyor. He's a member of the SC, SCI uh, QS uh, BIM Working Group, and he's a part time lecturer here uh, in GMIT. Just while Ingus is setting up, um, we're probably going to run a couple of minutes, so maybe it'll be quarter past, 20 past one if that's okay, so you might bear with us. Is there any question at this point in time? If we have time for maybe one question? For Ralph or for Killian? Okay. Uh, um, just a, a quick question. I mean, it struck me that um, most of what we're talking about here is, is heading towards the library, otherwise, you're repeating the process on every project. So uh, there'd be a general library. I mean, is that something that either Ralph or uh, uh, Killian is working on? Is that happening in their business? Yeah, I think you can answer that, Ralph, based on, on uh, some discussions we've had last week. So the standards. No, oh, a library. Oh, a library, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So a standard yeah. library, Ralph. Yeah, I suppose that would be the idea, but um, it hasn't happened yet. Uh, in the UK, the NDS has started working on a national building library in the UK. There's a lot of talk, I suppose, in Europe you know, about uh, understanding.
standardized way product manufacturers provide their data into national libraries. Um, there's a good um, example in France where uh, France has a similar housing crisis at um, a much bigger scale. And the government has actually put together a library of objects to do with housing. So they have 200 generic objects and 2,000 actual product objects. Um, so designers, and they make that available to the design community. So designers can start with generic objects which have all the right properties, and then eventually they can choose a product which has all the right data. So you know, it's just streamlining the way people work. At the moment, what's happening is a lot of designers are producing that information independently. So it's, they're doing it over and over again. So you know, we love to see national libraries. That answer your question? Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah, we'll sadly, it's what I was expecting. <laughs> okay. We, we let's, um, we'll roll on with Angus and we'll take a few more questions uh, as we go. Thank okay. you. Thanks, Mark. Um, so my name is Angus Callan and I'm here to talk to you about, I suppose, BIM from the quantity surveying side of things. <coughs> so uh, just quickly while I'm going to run through, I, I know we're, we're a bit behind, so I'll speed up a bit. So what the current QS BIM usage is, what the, some of the benefits are for... Uh, QS for involvement in the BIM process. There's two, I'm going to run through two projects that I worked on locally here uh, that had BIM elements and quickly touch on, on 5D cost modeling. So I think my background has kind of been discussed there by Mark. So what the current uh, BIM QS usage is. So at the moment the SCSI um, BIM working group which I'm a member of, I think there's about one third of quantities of errors in Ireland you know, participating in some element of BIM. Uh, the RACS in the UK, they did a survey, they think about half of the quantities of errors around the place have some element of BIM. My experience kind of locally here, uh, first of all from, from being uh, consultant in the industry and second of all part-time lecturing here. So every year the QS students go out on placement and in the last two years 40% of them QS students have been involved in either contractors or QS companies that are still doing manual takeoff only. I mean a scale rule, you know, Excel sheets, calculators, all of that. So no on-screen takeoff, and none of the students were working on any project that had any 3D element. I know locally there's some QSs, you know, still asking for A1, big A1 drawings to produce any kind of, of bill of quantities or you know schedules or anything like that. So to me, you know, this is what the, the modern QS workstation should be where you have your, your, your drawings on one side, you have your quantities and your schedules on the other, you have to flick between the screens, you know, it was a good excuse to clean my desk, but this is, this is what a productive, efficient quantities of air should be doing, not going back to the paper-based systems that Ralph and others have spoken about. So quickly, you know, what are the, some of the, the main benefits that a quantities of air can get from BIM? The first is what I would think is, you know, visualizing and filtering a project. So getting to understand your job straight away. So if you get a drawing, a project in, you know, it has 50 drawings, you have to go printing off all the drawings, you have to go through them, see what's involved. So this today was a six and a half thousand square foot house I had in Galway. So it's a fairly big house, there was about 200 drawings. So, you know, I want to be able to quickly identify stuff. So see this, uh, we have a little kind of feature deck there that the, the Arctic had in. If I wanted to figure out what that was, I'd probably have to go to four different drawings. So I'd go to a plan, an elevation, a section, and maybe a detail. Okay? But with a BIM model that I had, I can quickly isolate it. Two clicks of a mouse. Don't have to print four drawings. And straight away, I can measure it. I can see what it is, and I can cost it. Same thing again. Another job here. There was feature roof sprockets. Okay? So as a quantity sphere, I want to know, you know what it is where it is and how much of it there is. Okay? So quickly with a model, I can isolate straight away there, I can count them. And then zoom in, get the exact detail of it, get the links, and again, without printing any drawings. The accuracy that you can get with using BIM then, so any kind of a scale rule or anything like that, is that going to come up with 2.63 meters of length? There's no way you're going to get that accuracy goes back to the lean construction that, that Ralph again was on about, you know, eliminating over measures, under measures, claims, all that issues. Same thing, if I have duplications in any measures, you know, the model or the software will quickly pick that up for me and I can rectify it. So I'm not having any issues with over measures. 
improve productivity then. So Skanska UK, they're a construction development company. They've done a survey of their employees. They think that they can reduce their takeoff time by 50% by using the BIM process. So their QSs are spending 50% less time doing takeoff. So if you take into account that you know typically 75% of a QS's time is measuring, you know, you can see you're going to make savings straight away. So the speed of delivery we're going to get to shortly. And obviously then you have cost efficiencies associated with you know being able to figure out your job quicker, being having greater accuracy, and then obviously doing things a lot quicker. So quickly, you know, does, does uh, Killian even come up with some new software systems I've never heard of? There's a numerous different software systems that different designers, consultants are using. But to me, it doesn't really matter. The quantities of air can get information from any one of those, okay? We have this argument all the time with clients, they won't give you the model. They want to hold on to the model, they're afraid that you'll steal their, their information, all that. You can export it to what they call an, a DWFX or an IFSC file. So it's, it's what they call a read-only file. In other words, you're only able to take information out of that. You can't be you know, copying it, uh, changing it, or whatever other concerns they may have. So to me, there's no argument by get, to get the model in this format. They should have no, no objections. So then we talk about how it works. So we extract the data. So if you think about when somebody's building a model, right, they take a wall. So that wall, as Rafa said, has an object information in it. So it's going to say, that's a wall. You know, it's a blockwork wall. It's 350 thick. Okay. So that's the information that's going to be in the model about that wall. So what I can just extract that out then. So I'm going to talk about, this is a, an apartment development in Galway. It's in Salt Hill there. So quickly, just about the job. It's seven apartments in a retail unit. It's about two and a half million. It's the third biggest residential development in Goa City, which is kind of crazy, but that was touched on this morning. Uh, it's in situ concrete frame with blockwork cavity wall infills. It's an inner city development, so there's, you know, there's existing buildings each side. So there was all 2D, this job. This job was all 2D, so there was no element of BIM, and I took off the bill of quantities using on-screen takeoff from the 2D drops. So what I decided then was, I'd take very accurate records of what, how long it took me to do the 2D takeoff. I then went out, I outsourced the modeling and got the building drawn up. Okay, so we'll run through that now very quickly, but what, there's two different options for me to extract quantities. The first is a generic template. Okay, so Reva has a template that I can, uh, with, with the software that I use is Costex, you can automatically just extract based on the object property. So it'll give me what the wall is, a basic wall, a block, a floor, you know, floor. So there the categories is going to be element category, family name, and family type. Okay, so that's the information that's going to be in about the wall or the floor or whatever it is. So how do I take that out? So I'm all about action and less talk. So what I'm going to do is, this is the actual model that was built up. Okay, so this is one of the blocks, three stories in situ frame, and uh, I had, a, in fairness, a very good modeler to do it up for me. So he took all maybe about 50 2D drawings and built this model. So one single model instead of 50 drawings. So he did fairly well uh, detailed, so if you can see here, right, just to give you an idea. So he has modeled all the windows, the stairs, the doors, the lift shaft, even the roof structure there is all modeled. Okay, so what we're going to do now quickly is I'm going to import them quantities now using the generic template. Okay, this is all real time, I'm not speeding it up. I'm doing it off a laptop, so if I had a desktop, I'd have a much better, quicker machine. Now I have all my quantities, not all my quantities, though no, I'll stress that, I have all the quantities that were in the model taken off. So it's split them up between what they were, so gutters, handrails, railings, slabs. So if we look at the structural columns, okay? Just open them up, and now it'll give me, say, one second, no? It'll give me a measure there of where the columns are. So see the greens? So what it's giving me now is all the columns. It'll give me the size. I'll widen it up for a second, and it gives me the links. All right, and I can see in the building where exactly they are. Okay. Now that information, you know, is of limited use, really. So if I'm measuring, you know, I want to measure per floor, or I want to measure in accordance with arm. So you know, columns under 0.1 meter squared or over 0.1 meter squared. That's the way you should be describing it in your bill of quantities. All right. So at the moment, it's good for a high-level kind of check. Um, 
you know, it's, it's not really going to be a benefit to me only as a kind of a checking tool. I can't really take that information as it is and bring it directly into my bill of consciousness. Okay? So, we created there two, 339 quantities, different quantities in that time. That was real time done there. So the process is quick, you know, as I said, but it's, it's not, it's useful for high level analysis only. I'm not going to be able to use it in my bill of consciousness. So, my second option then is to do a model map. So I define how the model, the information is extracted from the model, okay? There's input, I can input formulas in so that when it's taking the information out, it'll give it to me in the format I want, okay? So I'm just, this is the way we had it there. That was the way we had it a minute ago. So it just gave me the structural columns and all of the different <coughs> sizes, all right? With a model map, I now have the ground floor columns, the first floor columns, and the second row columns split up, okay? That's the first step. Another further, I can export it to Excel. I can sort it, send it back into the model. Now I have the columns on the ground floor uh, exceeding 0.1 meters squared and over 0.1 meters squared. So that means that information there now, I can literally drag and drop that into my bill of contents straight away. I have a full traceability then where it came from. I'm able to do my remeasures a lot quickly. I also have the formwork sorted, ground floor, first floor, second floor plan. So this is, this is my results. So my 2D hours are there. And then I had what the 3D hours were. So overall, go through the different elements. I think I saved about 54% of my time of my measurement. Now I will stress, it was a very, very good model, which meant I had less time to spend checking it to make sure that it was the correct version of the 2D. All right? So you look through, I have every element kind of the hours inputted. So what I would say is, for me, if you look at say the structural elements, say like the frame, save an awful lot of time there. So the green or the blue is the 2D and the, the orange is the 3D. So saved an awful lot of time there on say the roof structure, the frame, even the finishes there, ceiling finishes. The, the schedule base items, I kind of found it didn't save that much time. So the windows, the doors, things like that took me kind of more or less the same time. But I think with a bit of practice, I'd be able to speed that up. So, uh, you know, I, overall, you know, I've saved myself probably a day and a half walk there. 13 hours, I think I had it down as in my takeoff. If I was given the model initially, you're correct. Yeah, I'll move on, sorry. So the second one then is a student accommodation here in Galway. Same thing again. Uh, it's refurbishment, ground floor, second floor, seal frame extension. The structural engineer in this job was using a Revit model. So he was using Revit, everybody else was using 2D. So again, I did the, the bill of quantities on 2D, and I took off my quantities for my structure off the Revit model. Okay? So quickly again, I'll just run this calculation, just to show you how quick it is. So this is the, the structural model that was there. So we have all the kind of darker steel there on the top floor, that's all the new steel. And he's modeled all the existing steel then as well, okay? So again, we'll just quickly do So in this instance, we've created 2,200 quantities. Okay, so maybe why it took a bit longer. So again, I'll just jump to the structural columns again to give you an idea. So same process again. So it's given me all the different column sizes here. So it hasn't split it per floor, but I know where there's new, new existing 152s and I knew where, or where there's existing and where there's new, and it's given me all the links here as well. So, you know, it's not that useful for bill of quantities. At bill of quantities, I need tonnages. I might need areas for, for intermittent painting. I might need the numbers to, to base plates, head plates, whatever else it may be. So this is the information we've got there. And now I would sort it again through my model map. So now, with a bit of manipulation of, of the uh, information, I know the number of columns, I know the length of them, I know the type, I know the volume, I know the area, and I know the weight. 
and that's probably taken me 15 minutes. So I've taken off the entire structure that would have taken in 2D <coughs> probably four hours in less than an hour in that instance. So I think overall, you know, it took me 40% less time to take off the structure. So that's, you know, eight hours at whatever your charge hour rate is. So I can spend that additional time either looking at constructability, looking at program, looking at procurement, or as a client saving. <coughs> Quickly onto 5D, as I said, I very much have an approach that you need to crawl first, then walk, then run. So for quantity surveyors, if there's any of the here in the audience, the 3D quantity extraction is your first step. You don't move on to anything to do with 5D until you've mastered that process. So what we're doing with, with 5D, Killian touched on it there, is you know, you're using the full model, so you're adding cost to the model. So that information we took out about the wall, what we're doing is we're literally going to add a cost code onto that. So we add a little cost code, we put in how much that concrete is, send that back into the model then. So if that's updated, it's telling me what change in cost there is, if there's a saving, if there's an extra. Okay. So the costs are parametrically linked, we get real-time cost feedback. So if the architect goes and he omits a part of the wall, he sees what the revised cost is straight away. He doesn't have to send it to the QS to update it, to see is that in budget, go back, do some value engineering, all that. So it gives full transparency in the cost process. I'm sure that the CISC do cash flow forecasting from their 4D models, so they input the costs into the models. You see, based on the program, you know, what stage the job is at. That will tell you how much money has been spent or they should have got. You can use it for progress claims. So, you know, you mark up on the model what's done. That tells you the value of, of what's done in the jo job so far. Any changes we spoke about. Final account can be pretty easy to, to resolve. And you need, it, involves you, it lets you to design to cost. So, you tell the architect who has, say, 100,000 to spend on the walk, okay? Or whatever your cost element that you have, you've done up in your budget. He's able to physically stop his drawings or stop his length of, of windows or whatever it is when he has reached that budget cost. Instead of having to send it to you to measure it, say that's over budget, take out this, do that. So it's all speeding up the whole process and making things efficient for everyone else. So just in conclusion, you know, to me, quantities of errors have a long way to go in the BIM process. They really need to start engaging in it, getting involved with the software. I mean, the benefits, I know there's some contractors here in the audience. How many of their QS and estimators, when they get a tender, go and remeasure the job? How long does that take? So if they're able to extract their information in half the time, you know, that's savings in their tendering costs, etc. Now, the QS is still going to be responsible for quantities, so there's major issues if the model is wrong. So you need to audit, verify, and check your models, okay? And finally, 5D modeling is adding cost to the 3D model. So I think that wraps it up for my end. Thank you very much. Thanks, Angus. Our next top topic is embedding research-informed resource efficiency practices into a large-scale construction company. <coughs> Jan Gotche uh, from, BAM, from BAM Ireland is an environmental and sustainability uh, coordinator uh, with BAM Ireland uh, with responsibility for all aspects of sustainability and community engagement. Uh, he's a graduate of GMIT also and is currently undertaking uh, a PhD uh, with Dr. Mark Kelly. I think you're probably ready to go, are you? Hi everyone. Um, so I suppose moving on to the lean construction side of things, uh, my talk today is on okay. embedding resor uh, research informed resource efficiency practices into a large building contractor, and in this instance, I suppose it's uh, BAM Ireland. So a bit of background on myself, I'm a past student in GMIT. I undertook my bachelor degree here in construction management, graduating in 2010, and did a master's in environmental systems in 2012. I'm still a student here part-time doing a PhD by research with Dr. Mark Kelly, the title of which is the development of a resource efficiency toolkit for the Irish construction industry and I work as the environmental and sustainability coordinator uh, with BAM Ireland. 
So the research, the PhD research project is funded by the EPA through the Cleaner Greener Production Programme and it's essentially a research collaboration between um, ourselves, BAM and GMIT. So using case studies to develop uh, resource efficiency practices for the Irish construction industry and the eventual output of that will be a toolkit for the industry. So just for BAM ourselves, we do believe that resource efficiency is having a positive impact on how we reduce our waste and CO2 emissions. And this is the historical data back to 2009. Um, despite increasing revenues, we're reducing our waste management. Um, last year, we reduced it by 5%. For CO2, kind of a similar picture, um, we reduced it by a large amount since 2009, and last year reduced it by 15%. So resource efficiency, what is resource efficiency? In its most basic form, it means doing more with less, and it covers the areas of energy management, waste reduction, water usage reduction, <coughs> and as a consequence of those three things, you're also gonna reduce your CO2 emissions. The EU states that it can increase economic opportunities, lower construction costs for a building and tractor, improve productivity on site, boost competitiveness, and support a low carbon economy. So the PhD study, uh, the research collaboration with BAM is focused on five case studies here in the west of Ireland. The top left is the construction of a primary and secondary school in Dugishka. Top right is the Lamb Institute in UHG. Bottom left is a multi-story car park again in UHG. Bottom right, recently completed human biology building in NUIG. And in the middle is the acute adult mental health unit again in UHG, which is an ongoing project. So the projects have ranged in value from um, roughly two and a half million to over 23 million. Um, over three years, we've conducted 535 resource efficiency visits to the, to the five sites. Um, and they've ranged in size as well from around four and a half thousand square meters up to over 8,000. So why do we want to improve resource efficiency on site? So the case study that I'm gonna use is the human biology building. So the value of that project was 23.17 million. And for the energy costs on that project, so namely electricity and diesel, the energy cost during construction was gonna be roughly 0.5% of the project value and 17.26% of the projected profit. The waste management costs were 0.37% of the project value and 14% of the projected profit. During the construction process, they used 3.3 million litres of water. And as a consequence of these things, they emitted close to 537 tonnes of CO2. So how do we improve resource efficiency on that site? So I'm just going to show you a couple of examples of things that we implemented on site to reduce energy costs, um, reduce waste, and obviously reduce CO2 emissions as well. So the first one, energy management. So a couple of really basic things. Um, the site accommodation is very uh, energy inefficient. So we did a bit of retrofitting. We installed thermostats, um, light sensors to make sure that the lights were switched off when the accommodation wasn't in use, door closers to keep the, the heat within the buildings, and then ensuring all the office equipment um, was automatically set to power down at night. So that reduced the energy cost by 9.2% and saved a total of 47 tonnes of CO2. Um, going forward, we'll be looking at A-rated site accommodation um, with the addition of photovoltaic panels uh, on the roof as well. Sticking with energy, nighttime electricity usage, we found that this was a, an issue on some of our sites where when we analysed the electricity bills, over 50% of the energy usage was at night, even though no work was taking place on site at night. So they were leaving on the lighting, they were leaving these transformer boxes plugged in. So they use 10% of the output even when they're, when they're just idling and not in use. So simple solution was to install a timer switch where the electricity in the building was switched off at night with the exception of the external security lighting. And then we had dedicated charging points for things like MEWPs um, on site. So that reduced the energy cost by 9.5% and again, reduced the CO2 by 47 tonnes. 
Um, then the security lighting around the perimeter of the site and also the lights on the crane. We just fitted photo cells onto those, again, to make sure that they were only in use um, during hours of darkness and switched off during the day. It's our reduced cost by 2% and a further 10.3 tonnes of CO2. Um, moving on to waste then. So because of the constraints of the site, we were only able to have a three skip um, policy on site. We had a timber, metal and a mixed waste skip. But even by just using those three skips, the waste management costs were reduced by 12%. And obviously the benefit of the metal skip is that it will provide revenue for the contractor as well. And sticking with skips, this is um, a timber skip on one of our sites. So we found that a couple of skips had a, a high amount of void space. So void space essentially means that you're paying the waste management contractor to take air off your site. So if we can encourage people to um, stack the materials more efficiently within the skip, we can reduce our costs. So what we did with that skip, we took the, all the materials back out of the skip. We stacked the exact same materials in the exact same skip and it reduced the, the void space by 60%, saving 192 euros on one skip. Um, on average, void space ranks in the top three waste types on site. Um, and one of our case studies, we found that every skip going out the gate of the site was costing 67 euros in, on air. So void space accounts for 27% of the waste management costs. So if you can reduce your void space by 50%, you reduce your waste management cost by 13.5%. And then supplier take-back schemes. So we implemented take-back schemes for uh, pallets and cable drums. Um, they take up a lot of space in the skips and they also create a lot of void space as seen in the last slide. So getting suppliers to remove these back off site when they bring in the next delivery reduced the waste management cost by close to 5%. Same with packaging, trying to put as many take-back schemes in place for packaging as possible, especially with there was a, a large furniture supplier on that project, so they had huge amounts of packaging. Um, the building was going to be basically a walk-in building where everything was installed. Um, and also the mechanical and electric contractor, we got them to set up um, take-back schemes as well. Just an example there, they had a, a section of the site where they could uh, store the, the cardboard while they were waiting to take it from, from the site. Um, and those few take-back schemes reduced the waste management cost by a further 7.5%. So the savings, the total savings from just those 10 initiatives um, represents a saving of 0.2% of the project value and the investment costs were just €892. Euros. So what we were trying to focus on was quick win, um, low cost options so that there wasn't a large investment cost during the, during the project. And the overall cost savings identified are a total of 24% of the total expenditure <coughs> on waste and energy during that project. So to conclude, all the possible solutions, as I said, they're low cost quick win options. And I should highlight as well that they're, what I spoke about was just during the construction phase. Obviously you can do things during the design phase to um, reduce your energy and waste costs as well. But the research project focuses on the construction phase only. Um, resource efficiency is easily achievable and cost savings can be made in many areas of energy usage and waste management. And maximising the construction industry's energy efficiency and reducing our waste are obviously both very good options for also reducing the, the greenhouse gas emissions output of our industry. So I want to thank you for your time. If any questions, we'll take them at the end or you can get me on the, the email address on screen. Thank you. Jan. And our last speaker before break, rethinking the construction supply chain in a circular economy, Dr. Dr. Mark Kelly, GMIT. Mark is a lecturer, as we know here, in the Department of Building and Civil Engineering, uh, covering modules at both undergraduate and postgraduate level. He has been involved in the applied funded research for over 16 years uh, in construction and demolition, uh, waste management, resource efficiency uh, in construction low energy design and construction education for, uh, for sustainability. Uh, his presentation today will give an overview of how the principles of the circular economy apply 
uh, to the construction sector. You all right? Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, thanks very much, Mark. Um, thanks very much. Thanks for waiting. I know you're all eager to go for lunch. Uh, the good news is I have the lunch vouchers for the external people, so you have to wait and listen to me for the next 10 or 12 minutes, and we'll hand them out at the end. Uh, basically, what I want to do today is sort of expand a little on what has been spoken already this morning, trying to link the whole area of BIM and Lean into what Jan has been working on for the last couple of years in resource efficiency onto the next step. So the thing with the environmental aspect of the construction sector, it seems to be moving all the time. So for a long time it was waste prevention, then it moved on to resource efficiency, and now we have a thing called a circular economy. So I just want to introduce what the circular economy is, give you some things to think about in relation to the circular economy, and how they relate to some research we're going on at the moment. So following on from Jan's project, which hopefully we'll have completed by the end of this year, no pressure Jan, um, We've got another project with the EPA working with Kerry Building Contractors, which is looking at cradle, the cradle opportunities in the construction sector. So we've also expanded our work with BAM. We're also doing work with JJ Radigans, and we've worked previously with uh, Sisk and Son, and Scott Tallon Walkers, Barn Recycling. So we have a number of companies that we're actually engaging with all the time. So very quickly, I'll skip through these, some of these slides quite quickly, but what we want you to do sort of do is stimulate some thinking about or reconceptualizing what you might think about traditional supply chain in the construction sector. So I'm not going to read out these definitions, you can read them yourselves. These are the two sort of main definitions that are being proposed for a circular economy. What I want to highlight are the key terms. So an alternative to our linear system. So if you step away from the construction sector for a minute and just think of everyday life, consuming products, it's usually a linear system, a take, make, dispose system. So the same can be applied to the construction sector. So what the circular economy looks to do is retain value for as long as possible. And where a component has to be broken down that it will go into loops, either a technical loop or a biological loop. So straight away there's a direct application because the construction sector, sector values durability, long lifespans. So that's a good link to what the circular economy as an overall concept means. So <clears throat> just to get you thinking a little bit, using a few photographs and visual cues, when you see a picture like this or when you go out onto a construction site, what do you think of? So you might think, well, that's normal. You might also think it might be good practice. Why would I say good practice? Well, we've segregated skips, we have a timber skip and we have a mixed skip. You might be, those of you that are really clued in, might be looking at health and safety issues. We have to work it out the hard hat and high vis, who should really have gloves on when they're handling materials. We have a separated compound for the waste. But if I read out just a general definition of waste, waste used or expend carelessly or to no purpose, other uses are misspend, misuse, throw away, <coughs> eliminate or discarded, of no, is no longer useful, um, unwanted excess, superfluous, cinnamon, other cinnamons, rubbish, refuse, litter, debris. So when you hear those words of a general definition of waste, how does that relate to what you see in the picture or what you might see in front of you? And this is one of the things Jan has been working on of how to get the message across. So one of the things that's all close to our hearts, I think, is money. So when you start putting in costs into it, then you start to look at it a little bit differently. So we have a number of different costs. Can't see the top one there, but the cost of materials in the skip it sells, the damaged materials, the skip pile, the cost to fill it, the cost of not selling the waste. So if it had a resale value. So that begins to get people's attention. Then if we put in the original purchase costs, of the materials and break it down and just picked out a couple of them, a couple of them there. And so now you start maybe seeing, well, hold on a minute, these have a value. And this is what the circular economy is trying to get across, that these materials have a value, that an existing building has a value, either to be maintained and used and adapted over its lifetime, but also at its end of life or end of use, that the materials within the building still have a value and a utility. <coughs> So now what you see when you go back to it again, and the, the biggest challenge is to look at this reconceptualization of waste, that, that's why it's inverted commas, that it is a resource. And this is what the circular economy from a policy point of view 
is trying to push towards. <coughs> As with many concepts, it's not a new idea. It's evolved over the last 20, 30 years, even further back, and some of the ideas there, cradle to cradle, biomimicry, the performance economy, the waste prevention hierarchy. But Ellen MacArthur, back in 2010, you may recognize her, she broke the world record for a solar circumnavigation of the globe in 2005. She was a yachtswoman. She retired in 2010. She set up this foundation, and she's got surprisingly a lot of traction over the last five or six years that she's converted this, she's pulled all of those ideas together into the circular economy concept, and now it's actually getting into policy statements. So we actually have an EU policy on it, which ties directly into a resource efficiency policy that's there from the EU from the construction, for the construction sector. We've seen cities and countries like Scotland and the Netherlands beginning to look at it, so they've developed their own policies. They've already done scans of cities as examples, Amsterdam and Glasgow, to see how would it apply there. So that's looking at things like food, it's looking at things like clothing, and so on. So it's gaining a lot of traction. In Ireland, we have a, a lot of sort of policies as well, which sort of relate to it. These are just a couple of them. And a lot of the research we've been doing in GMRT since about 2008, related to waste prevention and so on, ties into that as well. <clears throat> so this is what you're trying to look at. You're trying to see, can we split a building or the building components or materials in themselves down into two different cycles? the biological cycle and the technical cycle. So any natural building materials, so untreated wood, for example, would go into the biological cycle, but the vast majority of building materials we have are composites, complex, with maybe elements of toxicity, toxicity, so now they might enter the technical cycle. So how can you do that? How can you break a building down into those cycles and to keep it within the loop, within the industry, or in other industries. So one of the concepts was industrial symbiosis. What that means is a waste for one industry is a resource for another industry. So that also comes into it. So some examples across the world of some of those ideas. Toronto Tool uh, Library and Sharing Depot, which is looking at sort of community sharing and collaborative community sharing. A lot of the automobile industry have already been doing this. Reynolds have been doing a lot of this, remanufacturing elements since 1949. So that is there already. Cash, and the, which you all be familiar with, construction machinery, also do a lot of it. Zero Scotland, they're looking the way Scotland, they're looking at mobile phones because there's a lot of valuable materials contained in phones and how can we keep those in the loop. The performance economy is a very interesting one and it's been picked up by the construction sector actually. Philips have a system where they offer pay per lux. So you're not paying for a product, what you're doing is paying for a service. So they provide the lighting, they provide the management of the lighting, they try and keep it as the low cost as possible and they will do the replacement, the maintenance and also at the end of life they will deal with that as well. So you're buying it as a service, so you're not buying the product. Um, similarly with the Deso carpets, they have the same sort of concept. Resource Efficiency House in Scotland, which was recently built, has pulled in a lot of ideas like design for deconstruction, the use of recycled materials, and these things into an exemplar house in the BRE Innovation Park up there. So if you go back to the BRE Innovation Parks in the very beginning, what they did was build a standard sort of fabric and they threw on a load of renewables on them. What they found after monitoring them for about 10 years is the buildings weren't performing. So they actually tore all those buildings down. And what they're starting to do now is to build them up. And what they're looking at is resource efficiency, low toxicity, and can you take that building apart and reuse it in other aspects of the construction sector. <coughs> so there's a lot to think about in the supply chain when you're looking at the full life cycle. And those are just some of the issues. Okay. <coughs> Putting it back in a cycle again, what you're trying to do is each of the phases, can you reduce the outputs at each one of those phases? So the question marks are trying to reduce energy use, trying to reduce water use, trying to reduce waste production, and as Jan said earlier, that will mean that your CO2 emissions are down. But also, can we introduce any other loops into the system so that you're retaining the value all the time, or reusing the material? So the difference between your reuse and recycling, your reuse shouldn't have a process other than maybe cleaning, 
Recycling, you're going into a process. So once you're in a process, you have outputs. So you have energy use, you have transport distances, water use, etc. So you're trying to avoid that as much as possible. <clears throat> so we're trying to move to this linear system where you have outputs at each phase into a more circular system where you split it up into your material cycle, biological and technical, and also your performance cycle. So this sort of leads on from Jan's work and working on the last couple of years in that we found by doing the resource efficiency best practice on site, there was actually opportunities to have, and we call them sort of mini loops. And so the examples that Jan spoke about, the take back scheme, well, that's a mini loop. It's going back, so it's not going into a skip. So we don't, there's a psychological, if it's in the skip, it's a waste. So we're trying to stop it getting that far. So if we can get the suppliers to take it back, and I'll talk about that in a second where it's a, a bigger challenge, that's a, a mini loop, that's within the circular economy. There are a lot of challenges though, when you're moving from resource efficiency to what we've been working on to this concept, because it's really coming from a sort of manufacturing background. And what we're trying to do is edit it and adapt it to the construction sector. So the complexity of buildings, complexity of materials, so as the increased demand for say thermal performance is keep increasing, we're getting more complex materials, phase change materials and so on. So you try and take that material apart at its end of life, it's very difficult. You try and recover it, it's very difficult. So what do we do with it? Is there a market for it? And at the moment in Ireland, there isn't a lot of markets for those sort of materials. So when you look at one of the jobs you're working on at the moment, when, when you see this picture here on the left and you see your Kingspan installation being delivered, a number of things should come into your head. The first thing is, it has a function, which is probably to improve the thermal performance. But what comes into my head is, there's packaging, it's on pallets, there's going to be offcuts. So, how do we deal with those things? And so when you look at your offcuts there, you can, you can you say, well, what's the cause? Or who's to blame? Okay, and there's a number of different reasons. And this is interesting when you're trying to identify who, who's responsible. So, is it poor design where the material is not optimized because they're standard sizes? So as the building doesn't fit the materials, the materials have to fit the building. Okay. Is it poor workmanship on site? <coughs> so, and what do we do with it? So do we segregate <coughs> it? Do we go to the supplier and say, will you take back insulation? The usual response you'll get is, we don't do that, mainly because of the volume, but they'll say, well, we're a member of Repack. And so what a member of repack means is they're paying a fee to repack, but it is no real relation to what's happening on the site. So they may be doing this part of their production process, but logistically and from a cost point of view, they don't see a benefit of doing it from a construction site point of view. Okay? And that's their prerogative. They can do that if they want. So your next protocol, go to the waste contractor and say, look at if we segregate and bag those insulation offcuts, will you give us a cheaper price? And the likely answer is yes, if there's a market for it. Now the market is RDF, usually energy recovery. It's usually not in Ireland. It's usually Germany, India, China, depending on who comes in and out of the markets. And so by segregating it and bagging it, you are reducing your costs from a construction <coughs> point of view, but the waste management contractor has to have a market for it. So you're sort of caught in the middle and you're looking back the loop and forward into the loop <coughs> trying to see how you live. So it is a big challenge. The interesting thing is it can be done. So Kingspan have done this, not blaming Kingspan if there's anyone here from Kingspan, but they have done it with Wilmot Dixon as a case study in the UK, but it was done in the tender stage, in the very, very early stages. They said we're buying X amounts of insulation of you for this large building as part of the contract, we want to have a take back scheme. And they agreed. And you go to any Kingspan websites, there it is promoted, promoted, promoted. But unless that engagement isn't there at the very early stage, it's very difficult to go to the supplier when you're two or three months in and you realize, God, we've an awful lot of offcuts here. Okay? So you need to engage very early. There's a lot of interesting stuff going on in Europe at the moment looking at these ideas. So the gypsum, the gypsum project looked at plasterboard waste and try to get post-consumer gypsum waste back into the production process. 
okay, a number of large companies across Europe, and they succeeded in getting 30% back in. So that's a closed loop cycle. Okay? The BAMB, Buildings as Material Banks, is about 11 million euro project across Europe as well. And BAM are one of the participants in it. And that's looking at very interesting things that links into BIM, links into virtual reality as well, is it looking at material passports. So you've seen earlier from the presentations that it's about information, it's about data. So as Angus is pointing out, here's your wall, 350 mil, I think you said. You have your data that you bring in for your takeoff or your QS. But what if you had elements of what's the rating for deconstruction? What's the rating for circularity? What's the potential market of it? If it's tied with QR codes and so on. So this is what it's looking at. So it's developing 300 material passports. Now they're called the manufacturing product biographies. They're the same concept. But that's going to feed directly into your BIM models and into your BIM process as well. They're also looking at a thing called reversible design, which is you can take the building apart. It used to be called design for deconstruction for years, for the last 20 years, people have been talking about it. The big challenge is there is from a designer's point of view, you know, are you going to be around in 150 years' time to see the building be deconstructed? Or what's going to be the situation in 100 years' time? And so for a lot of designers, there's no motivation to do it unless it's a requirement from the client or from the planning authority, which it usually isn't. RPS has also been involved looking at the mixed fraction of CND waste across Europe. So the mixed obviously is the most challenging. <clears throat> Just recently a prototype was built um, by Arab and BAM and it was hosted at a number of events in the UK and it's the first, uh, first prototype of a circular building and it has a number of different features there. But basically they assemble it, disassemble it, bring it around to all these design shows made from reclaimed materials and recycled materials and so on. So it's to get these prototypes up and running to see how well they work. Denmark as well has been leading the way and they've tied into a number of interesting things in the whole concept of the whole use of 3D printing of buildings, 3D printing of building materials and the opportunities to link that into BIM, how that can make a building more sustainable or more resource efficient. Also looking at the performance economy, 35 to 40 percent of office space is the maximum use in Denmark of office space used during working hours. So they have 60 to 65 percent of office space that's not been utilized. And so what they're looking at is this sharing of space, which follows on from the success <coughs> of Airbnb, if anybody's used that, which has moved on now to a thing called liquid space, which is very popular in San Francisco and so on, but we also have elements of it in Galway, where you share office spaces as well. So these, Denmark as a country, are looking at these strategies from a construction and real estate point of view. <clears throat> so you try and pull all of these ideas that are floating around together to see can you look a bit into the future. And so one of the big challenges is connections. So if you can think of a building in layers and you can identify the different lifespans within the layers, you look at the connections and the Scottish EPA have produced a very good design for deconstruction guidance which gives you details on how to take a building apart. Link that into a project that's going on in the University of West England, which is trying to merge BIM with reversible design and design for deconstruction. Tie that into what we're seeing from a virtual reality, augmented reality, and BIM processes off and on site to the potential for 3D printing. So 3D printing is being promoted in the University of South Carolina and in the States as being a, a, a way of meeting the social housing need. So we're not just about, you know, prevent uh, printing a nice little design and showing it off on a website, they're looking at producing a whole kit linked with robotics to you know, do a speed build okay, to a high specification. And how that links that then into biomimicry, which is one of the original concepts, which is basically trying to mimic nature to improve the efficiency of your engineering output as well. So there's all of these ideas floating together and they're beginning to become merged now within the circular economy. Just a couple, two more slides. <clears throat> the construction sector, when people think of the future, if you read any, any foresight studies of 2030, 2050, they're always usually grounded in the present. So it's a natural reaction for someone to try and predict the future and ground it in the present. So when you try and put some scenarios out there, 
what you should do is try and put a scenario out there that mightn't seem realistic and then work back from it. So a couple of scenarios here. If every project required a submission of a resource management plan, that's an immediate thing that could be done from a planning point of view. They had a waste management plan requirement in the UK under site waste management regulations. It was being very successful and the government got rid of it, said there was too much red tape. And they said, well, we'll rely on people to be voluntary after that. And it, the production has gone up, okay? So that was a government decision to get rid of something that was working really well from a planning point of view. But when you're looking at extraction of natural material or virgin materials, say if you were limited in 20 or 30 years' time that you could only use X amount, well, what does that mean? What if you had benign, so non-toxic, reusable, recyclable, reversible, data-rich buildings by 2025? Embracing uh, material cycles and net positive environmental impacts, that already is there under the, one of the big environmental assessment um, methods, living building challenge. So that's again an immediate thing. So once we thought 2020 was very, very far in the distance, it's only three years away, so now things are shifting to 2050, 2030, 2050. But as we've seen this morning, the industry is beginning, led a lot of it through. It doesn't matter what horse you jump on once you make the progression, but BIM, whether it becomes a mandatory requirement or a phased in requirement, can encapsulate a lot of these ideas. We have 17 new sustainable development goals as well that can be used as looking at your corporate social responsibility from a sector point of view. And then from looking inward for ourselves, what does that mean for us as a higher education institution? So we launched our green campus there before Christmas, but should we be moving to a sustainable community? So should we be moving to a circular campus? And so everything is moved. Just when you think you're progressing, things are moving on again. What does it mean for student graduate competencies? What does it mean by the way we teach? So all of these things, just like was mentioned earlier on, BIM isn't a technology, it's a methodology. That if we can integrate BIM as a methodology, looking at collaborative working within the curriculum and integrate these things, then we might have a curriculum that looks toward 2020 and 2025, which we should be doing. When you have a first year coming in here next year, but well, they're not out till 2021. So we've moved into that area. That's me, I think. Thanks for your attention. Thanks, Mark. Do we have an appetite for some questions or just an appetite? Okay. From here. Okay. For Angus, I'll take this one, yeah? I'm just wondering, the, uh, it's good to see the savings in relation to the public sphere of time. Is that not a reflection of the additional amount of work that's required on the architect side? And, and do they balance out? Absolutely not. I mean, you ask anybody that wants to draw something in CAD or Revit, the time they do to do it in CAD and Revit is, you know, half. I don't, I don't know, Brad might give some, some figures there on it, but to do something up in 3D is, once the technician is trained up and upskilled, it's a hell of a lot quicker to do anything like that. I don't think, well, the key point of leading back to is, is that reduction in time taken reflected in the <coughs> Well, I've, I haven't seen many terms, like, it's, it's up to individuals to, to embrace that, you know, if they want to offer a more competitive price, a more competitive service, I think that's the way it's been reflected as opposed to, you know, clients' requirements looking for X, Y, and Z. Do you want to jump in there, Rob? Yeah, I think the big challenge in the presentation is that, you know, clients aren't asking for them because it's not what they want, you know, and, uh, and a lot of architects and engineers are not using them because the clients are not asking Definitely, to produce information in term is far more efficient than traditional information. Because traditionally, you'd have to draw a plan, a section, an elevation, a detail. You'd have to type out a schedule. So if you're creating the same information, the same description of every building element six or seven times, if you need to change it, you've got to change it six or seven times. It's better than doing it once. So it's a far more efficient way. But there's, there's very little collaboration, I suppose. You know, I've talked to quantity surveyors, and they say, well, 
the models we get of no use to us because they're not used properly. Uh, if nobody's telling the architects how they should be produced. You know, the, I mean, the architects are producing them in a way that suits them as an as a efficient way of doing it. We're getting no feedback. And I'm on the architects uh, committee. There's no feedback from the SSI or the country study profession on what information would be useful. We, but you know, if you created it once, if you created it right the first time, that would be super efficient for everybody. So you know, there needs to be some discussion. Can I answer your question? Connecting with those. Any more? Another one? Okay. Well, I just want to thank our speakers. I want to thank Ralph, Killian, Angus, Jan, and Mark, and also for, to GMIT for hosting it, and for you for coming along. Thanks very much.